also known by SEEDS. And I am very proud to be a daughter of a SEEDS country, the archipelago of Cabo Verde in West Africa. And I am fully aware of the challenge and vulnerability of SEEDS. Our distinguished speakers and panelists joining from all around the world will discuss these challenges, particularly in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. But before we get started, I would like to remind our participants that we have interpretation from English to French, from French to English. Please tune in to your preferred language at the bottom of your screen. And also please mute yourself in order for us to have the best sound for uh, to understand and to follow each other. The dialogue is being recorded and streamed on FAO.org, on our YouTube channel, as well as on the UN Web TV channel. The recording will be available on the FAO Brussels webpage. If you tweet, don't forget to use the hashtag FAO Brussels Dialogue. Throughout the event, colleagues will be monitoring the chat box and post links and resources, and they will be trying as much as possible to reply to your questions. To help set the tone for today, let's start by watching a video on the five things that FAO does to support seeds. Let's watch the video. Now let's move and without further ado, I would like to give the floor to FAO Brussels Director, Rodrigo La Puerta for his welcoming remarks. Rodrigo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria Elena. Excellencies, colleagues and friends, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is a great honor to welcome you all to this special edition of the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO Brussels Dialogue. Our focus today is the small island developing states, as Ms. Semedo just mentioned, the seeds. Today, we are here to do what seeds can do better. Even when they are far away from each other, seeds countries make connections. They connect by way of the culture through the joy of living. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is posing additional challenges to the sustainable development of the seeds. Disruptions in the food value chain, severe damage to the tourism sector, and lower remittances are bringing immense constraints to the capacity which countries have to address the impact of climate change and the triple burden of malnutrition. But now we are here together and together we can look at solutions. I would like to convey my deepest gratitude for the generous presence of seats, heads of state and government. You are showing your commitment to the sustainable development agenda. Today, we will look at the challenges, but also at real projects and real solutions. FAO is a long-standing and trustworthy partner of the seeds. With the European Union and the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States, OACPS, we will highlight projects 
in seats in the three regions, in Africa, the Caribbean, and the Pacific, which will show not only real results on the ground now, but also what we can achieve even more together. So I thank you all for attending once again in great numbers, and I am passing the floor immediately to FAO Director General, Dr. Chi Dongyu. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Rodrigo. Distinguished uh, guests, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Rome. The small island developing state seeds face unique vulnerabilities and challenges. Climate change, geographic and economic isolation, insufficient land resources, and the drastic change in deaths have contributed to an increase in malnutrition and non-communicable diseases across the seas. The COVID-19 pandemic has further aggravated the pressing challenges. Today's event is part of our broad efforts to support these countries and confirm the commitment from UN family, the international community, and from our partner, the European Union. We are dis displaying several videos of our excellent collaboration with the seeds in all the regions of Africa, the Caribbean, and the Pacific. Just to name some of these projects, the support to rural entrepreneurship, investment and trade in Papua New Guinea project, the sustainable fisheries and aquaculture in Africa, the Caribbean, and the Pacific project the action against the desertification, the sustainable wildlife management, and the EU emergency relief support to Hurricane Horoi. Ladies and gentlemen, the third international conference on small island developing states of 2014 had an overkill theme. The sustainable development of small island developing states through the genuine and durable partnerships. EFA is proud of the junior, durable, and the solidated partnerships with the seeds. The Samoa pathway called for concerted global action for the seeds. And EFA was invited to facilitate the development of an action plan to address food security and nutrition challenges faced by these states. As a result, and through an inclusive process, in 2017, FAO and other partners launched the Global Action Program on Food Security and Nutrition in Small Island Developing States, GAP. GAP aims to facilitate a comprehensive uh, multiple sectors approach to identifying and implementing priority actions at the local, regional, and global levels. We are currently working on outlining a definition of resilient agro-food systems, which will allow for even more focused work under the gap. This definition will be included in the 2021 edition of FAO's flagship report, the state of food and agriculture so far. Ladies and gentlemen, the high priority FAO is giving to seeds is reflected in our concrete actions. In September 2019, we launched the FAO's flagship hand-in-hand -hand initiative, hi hi which uh, envisages the accelerated agricultural transformation, sustainable rural development through a country-led, country-owned, and evidence-based process. hi hi prioritizing the most vulnerable countries, including those affected by natural or human-induced crisis. hi hi is also active in seven small island development states already. Your Excellency, please promote matchmaking between locals with e-commerce e platforms for direct marketing accessibility. In the seeds, the Hi Hi initiative is using a territory approach to prioritize the investment required for the increased incomes of, of the poor farmers within the framework of sustainable agro-food systems. In January this year, I established the Office of Small Island Development State, least developing countries and the landlocked developing countries to coordinate in-house cross-cutting action to support 
of these countries. This is the first in the UN professional entities. Honey, honey initiatives and our work in the seeds are also directly linked with FAO COVID-19 response and recovery program launched in July, 2020. This program focuses on immediate, media, and the long-term actions to prevent the health crisis from becoming a food crisis. It is a holistic approach designed to strengthen countries' resilience and build back better towards transforming agri-food systems in their specific contexts. Distinguished guest, during the COVID-19 pandemic, FAO has continued to advocate for food security and nutrition in the seeds. I call upon all seeds to join one South Digital Village initiative to integrate the value chain of agriculture with the tourism. During the September, I had a uh, uh, signed MOU with uh, UNWTO uh, together to promote those uh, uh, digital village or digital town initiatives. Action policy options and investment plans are working out with our partners. The CEDS and the FAO will continue to work jointly on making agri-food systems more inclusive, more re resilient, and more sustainable thereby combating hunger, malnutrition, poverty among the vulnerable populations. We believe that their needs must be prioritized in the global development agenda. Let isolated seeds become a harbor of agri-food systems transformation. Let us work together for the better future of seeds by four batters, better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life. And then we can really build a back better and stronger for the people in seeds. I thank you, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Director General, for um, referring to the broad efforts FAO is undertaking to support seeds, how hand in hand is supporting seeds to increase resilience and calling upon the seeds to integrate 1000 village initiative. Now is my pleasure to welcome our high level guests. And we are delighted to have with us today, the president of the Republic of Guyana, Her, His Excellency Mohamed Irfan Ali, the president of the Republic of Palau, Tommy Ezang Remengeso, the president of the Republic of Suriname, His Excellency Chandri Kapersad Santoki, the Prime Minister of the Independent State of Samoa, Tulepa, Lupe Solai, Salele, Malilegao, the Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of Santome, His Excellency Georges Lopes Bonjesus, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Fiji, His Excellency Josiah Vorega Bainimarama. A warm welcome to all of you, Excellencies, and many thanks for joining us today. Now, please let me turn to the President of Republic of Guyana, His Excellency, Mr. Mohamed Irfan Ali. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Excellencies, Shedon Ju, Director General, of the Food and Agriculture Organization, Mr. Rodrigo de la Potero, Director of the FAO Office in Brazil, Huta Arpilinen, Commissioner of International Partnership, Heads of States of Member Countries of Small Island Developing States, Honorable Ministers, Ladies and Gentlemen. I'm honored to address this year's Food and Agriculture Organizations high-level dialogue. I commend the Food and Agriculture Organization for organize, organizing this relevant, timely, and beneficial forum on the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects on food systems and small island developing states. My country, Guyana, is a low-lying coastal state, but shares many of the vulnerabilities of these states. The COVID-19 pandemic and its attendant consequences 
have disrupted the lives of millions globally. Guyana remains deeply concerned about the wide-ranging economic, social, and environmental implications of COVID-19, <clears throat> particularly the difficulties posed for the world's small island developing states. Recently, my country had the privilege as chair of the group of 77 and China to host a high level meeting on the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the global efforts to combat climate change. A resounding echo from that forum is that the world, especially developing states, needs to support developing countries both during and after the pandemic. Excellencies, <clears throat> undoubtedly, small island developing states have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 crisis. As the FAO recognizes, the pandemic has adversely impacted food security, nutrition, climate resilience, health, tourism, education, and remittances. Increased public health outlays have led to a reduction in resources, which would otherwise have been devoted to other areas, including food system and supplies. We must also take into consideration our education system and the effect post-COVID would have on school attendance and dropouts. The vulnerabilities of SIDS have also been compounded by the dependence on food imports, especially given their limited natural resource base. The COVID-19 pandemic placed limitations on trade, which was compounded by the lack of timely access to markets. These disruptions can further undermine the economies of small island developing states, if not quickly remedied. Excellencies, preserving and improving the food economy should be an essential component of the socioeconomic response to the COVID-19 crisis. Addressing food security, however, cannot be undertaken in isolation to other socioeconomic challenges. The complexities of the challenges facing small island developing states demand multidimensional and integrated approaches. The scale and scope of the existing socioeconomic challenges facing all states necessitates a new era in international cooperation. The more developed countries must immediately take steps to support small island developing states through a menu of mechanisms, including debt relief, balance of payment support to help SIDs meet their food import bills, technical support for agriculture, capacity building, and financing for agricultural development. Small island developing states also have a responsibility to accelerate progress towards sustainable, nutrition-sensitive food systems in addressing their food security and nutrition challenges. International organizations, such as the Food and Agricultural Organization, must become strident advocates on behalf of small and vulnerable states, including small island developing states. These international organizations must support the calls for the suspension of debt service payments and to deploy these deferred payments to enhance food security in small island developing states. Additionally, international stakeholders are urged to emphasize <laughs> solution to the challenges which many small states face, such as resource constraints, difficulties in accessing supply chains for essential foods not produced locally, limited access to concessional financing and official development assistance, and susceptibility to catastrophic natural disasters. 
I therefore call on the international community to advance SIDS SIDS visibility and provide the requisite, requisite financial and technical support to bolster resilience building efforts. We are duty bound to think collectively and act in solidarity to save humanity. To this end, the Cooperative Republic of Guyana commends the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations for leading the international charge in assessing and responding to the effects of COVID-19 on food systems and economies of small island developing states. We have to face these challenges together, overcome the hurdles and ensure that we survive post COVID. I thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Excellency, for um, your thoughts and thank you for uh, calling upon our um, and highlighting how COVID-19 has affected the seeds. You call for a new era for international cooperation, for more solidarity, and you call upon the Food and Agriculture Organization to become a strong advocate for the cause of seeds. But you heard the voice of the Director General. I think you have on the Director General a big advocate of small island development states. Ladies and gentlemen, now I have the pleasure to, to, to see a video, to play a video on, um, on the sustainable wildlife management. Guyana has been one of the pilot countries of the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program, which is a multi-partner program financed by the European Union and led by FAO that aims to protect wildlife in fragile ecosystem. And here you have a short video to give us an idea of the program of work in Guyana. Let's watch the video. My pleasure to give the floor to the President of the Republic of Palau, His Excellency Tommy Hemengesau, a galvanizing voice of SEEDS, who has been with FAO for the launch of the Global Action Plan on Food Security and Nutrition and on SEEDS, and has sent a video message. Please, let's watch the video. Mr. Director General, Excellencies, Delegates, I congratulate FAO Brussels for organizing this timely high-level dialogue to spotlight the challenges posed by COVID-19 and the food systems of small island developing states. I am happy to recall FAO's early engagement with the Samoa pathway and the implementation of the Global Action Program for Food Security and Nutrition in SITS in 2017. More recently, I am also glad to note the creation of a dedicated office for seats within the FAO. Island states uh, depend on the ocean for our livelihoods, from tourism to fisheries, transport and climate regulation, our well-being is intertwined with the health of our ocean. In Palau, 
we have been fortunate to have been COVID free, but we have not been free of COVID's economic impacts. And our climate crisis continues to accelerate. A healthy ocean needs a stable climate because of our food systems are put at risk. We need to strengthen our resilience to help the climate impacts already being felt and those that will intensify, such as drought, sea level rise, and extreme weather events. And we can do so by turning to our ocean. Palau is proud to have created our national marine sanctuary, covering 80% of our maritime territory as a no-take protected area. The sanctuary came into force this year and is a landmark effort at marine protection. But it also has important goals for increasing fish tax spillovers, their resilience to ocean change, and ultimately our food sec and economic security. Many seeds and partners have already signed up to support the Dori by Dori goal in the next global biodiversity framework. We need more to do so. More than five years ago, we were also one of the first countries in our region to ratify the Port State Measures Agreement, a cornerstone in our fight against illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. But we still need to do more to achieve a healthy, productive, and resilient ocean. Last week, the 14 leaders of the Ocean Panel, which I co-chair, launched our new Ocean Action Agenda. At the heart of it, is a commitment to 100% sustainable ocean management by 2025 to balance protection and production in order to achieve equitable prosperity. This 100% commitment provides a framework to achieving the bold yet pragmatic recommendations that our report sets out. Food security and more resilient food systems feature heavily in these. The Ocean Panel's call to all ocean and coastal leaders is that we need to give the ocean 100%. We urge others to join us in this commitment. With the support of our partners, including the FAO, by turning to the ocean, we can build back better and bluer from this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, President, reminding us that with oceans, we can build back better and blue. And I would like to inform you that due to the limitations, we had to cut the video message to five minutes. But you can find the full message in the link my colleagues have posted in the chat. And now is my pleasure to turn to the President of Suriname, His Excellency, Chandri Kapersad Santoki. Let's follow the video message from the president. Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization, Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, on the occasion of the high level FAO Brussels Dialogue, I thank the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, for organizing a key event so important for the small island developing states and for the Caribbean region in particular, since our countries are so vulnerable to the impacts of the climate change. I would also like to commend the work of Ambassador Burleson as current chair of the CARI Forum in Brussels. Suriname is proud member and partner of CARICOM and is always ready to facilitate dialogue and coordination. Agriculture, forestry, and fisheries contribute an estimated 10% to GDP and is crucial sector for the economy of Suriname. Nevertheless, the sector is faced with several challenges and the transformation of the agriculture and food systems into viable and sustainable production systems using innovation, 
and technology is never more urgent. In this regard, we seek the continuous support of the FAO and other development partners. This milestone was achieved with the continuous support from partners, countries, and international cooperation. Together with UN agencies such as FAO, we elaborated a development plan focusing on economic stabilization through economic diversification of broad private sector development, geared towards building back better after COVID-19. This partnership with the UN agencies within Suriname seeks to support the government in the achievement of the SDGs and to ensure that no citizen is left behind. My government is open and inclusive and will focus on private public sector partnership. In this regard, Suriname is currently working on developing an act on SDG 17 promotion and facilitation of corruption-free public-private investments and business interests for our sustainable development. Through the Suriname European Union National Indicative Program, NIP, the European Commission allocated 13 million euro for the Suriname Agriculture Market Access Project, SAMAP, led by FAO. Together with Suriname's Minister of Agriculture, SAMAP focuses on enhancing agriculture output, competitiveness, and safe production of selected crops through enabling environment and enhanced capacity of private sector and institutions and the strengthening of commodity value chains. Amidst the pandemic, by December 2020, SAMAP will sign 65 grant agreements with farmers with the aim of strengthening the capacity of farmers, farmer organization, and agribusiness to improve agriculture quality production whilst maintaining food safety and to facilitate their market access. In 2021, it is expected to expand this to more than 200 small and large producers. This is also important to note in the context of last week's signature of a partnership agreement between CARICOM with its private sector organization, which will establish a legal framework for cooperation and collaboration between the CARICOM members and the private sector. It will surely pave the way towards the full implementation of the CARICOM single market and economy recognizing that the private sector is well placed to contribute positively to the Caribbean single market and economy regimes of free movement of goods, services, labor, and capital. I'm very positive that partners such as FAO and European Union will contribute to enhance this transformative regional initiative, particularly amidst the impacts of COVID-19. I respectfully Thank and greet you. God bless you all. Thank you, and thank you for highlighting the importance of technology, innovation, partnership, enable environment for private sector and also agribusiness. We are pleased to have head of state from all regions where there are small island development states, giving a truly global perspective that underlines the similarities and also the differences faced by seeds. Next, we have a message from His Excellency, the Prime Minister of the Independent State of Samoa, His Excellency, Tulepa, Lupelosai, Salele, Malilegao. Let's follow the video from the, the Prime Minister. Excellencies, heads of state and government, Director General FAO, ladies and gentlemen. Small island developing states are ranked among the most vulnerable countries in the world. Fisheries, tourism, and agriculture contribute significantly to our national gross domestic products, yet their vulnerability and fragility make it more challenging for sets to produce adequate food supplies to meet the needs of our populations. 
So now, more than ever, we look to garner ways by which to raise our visibility and to invite the international community to support and bolster our resilience building efforts. We see the FAO Brussels Dialogue as a key opportunity to inspire such unity of support, to identify solutions and pathways for sets, to improve their food security and livelihoods, and be able to draw inspiration from FAO projects funded by the European Union. We are aware in Brussels of the active engagement of the SETS ambassadors, including our own, through the activities in the framework of the Organization of Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific States to provide important advocacy awareness and visibility opportunities for discussion and dialogue. FAO has also selected six sets out of 27 priority countries for the first phase of its flagship initiative, Hand in Hand. Five of these sets are from the Pacific region. As a central element of the Samoa pathway, the blueprint for sets of sustainable development, the lead role of FAO in the Global Action Program on Food Security and Nutrition, supporting ZETS through policy advice. As well, they have provided the means of implementation of more sustainable and resilient food systems and associated agriculture, climate change adaptation, livestock, fisheries, and aquaculture, forestry, and natural resource management practices. The high cost of energy, transport, and communication lead to development conditions that often curb opportunities for private sector development to stimulate domestic food production with limited overall investment in commercial agriculture and improved technology. While we may have far more nutritious food within our countries or sub-regions, many factors that include limited or no access, lack of price competitiveness, and policy infrastructure push us to either import or substitute imports with less healthy foods. These have contributed to the current complex food security and nutrition situation, with Zets facing a looming health crisis from the triple burden of malnutrition. It is our hope that FAO Brussels dialogue will build in-depth understanding of the challenges of Zets, particularly with regard to the disruption of food systems in times of COVID-19 identify the gaps and opportunities for financial and technical assistance on food production, as well as identify lessons learned from sets in building resilience on food production against climate change and other natural hazards, risks, and shocks. The coalescing of these shared experiences will help small islands developing states mitigate the devastating impacts of COVID-19 in their food systems and ensure the achievement of a sustainable future. What more can we ask but for you all to be part of the solution? I thank you for your attention. So far. Thank you, thank you, Prime Minister, and for highlighting also the leading role of FAO in the implementation of the Samoa pathway. Fisheries are vital to Samoa economy, as we heard from the Prime Minister, but also to many other seeds economies. Allow me to play a short video that showcases the Fish for ACP program operating in 10 African Caribbean Pacific countries 
to strengthen the fish value chain. Let's listen to the video. Let's move to Africa. San Tome and Principe is one of the countries where FAO and partners with the support of European Union and Organization for African, Caribbean and Pacific States is active in the FISH for ACP program. It is my honor to introduce His Excellency Georges Lopes Bonjesus, Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of São Tomé e Príncipe, Monsignor Bom Jesus, tem a palavra. Je suis très ravi de pouvoir me diriger à cet événement de la FAO sur l'impact du Covid-19 sur les systèmes alimentaires des petits états insulaires en développement. Avant le Covid-19, Sao Tome et Principe avaient déjà ces problèmes structuraux et justement avaient beaucoup de mal à répondre à la demande du marché pour la production des biens et des services en raison d'un secteur informel grandissant le taux de chômage très élevé, la faiblesse des secteurs de l'agriculture, de la pêche et de l'élevage. De plus, nous vivions déjà le défi de la production alimentaire pour répondre aux besoins de la population. Ces questions ont été naturellement exacerbés par l'avènement de la pandémie. En tant que PID, la République démocratique de Sao Tomé et Principe voit aussi les effets du Covid-19 en vue de notre vulnérabilité au changement climatique, de la malnutrition, tout en gardant une forte dépendance sur le commerce international et les productions alimentaires importées. Mais au milieu des défis, je peux aussi fournir de bonnes nouvelles. En mai, notre ministre de l'Agriculture a signé un protocole 100% pour transformer le système agricole à adopter une production totalement bio avec la promotion des pratiques agroécologiques tout en garantissant la sécurité alimentaire et nutritionnelle du pays. L'objectif principal est de promouvoir une production et une consommation alimentaire locale durable. Par ailleurs, comme une réponse à l'impact de la pandémie, sur la chaîne d'approvisionnement alimentaire, un projet de plusieurs partenaires, le PAM, le FAO, l'ONU Habitat et l'OIT, en collaboration avec des acteurs nationaux, prévoit l'accès des 540 familles vulnérables à l'entraînement et renforcement des capacités pour faire face à l'insécurité 
alimentaire croissante. Il s'agit d'un bon premier pas, mais il y a beaucoup d'autres familles qui souffrent dont nous voudrions trouver d'autres opportunités de financement pour élargir à d'autres zones de notre petit archipel. En outre, avec le soutien stratégique de l'Union européenne, je note que le projet FISH 4 ACP nous permettra d'augmenter la production et la compétitivité des chaînes de valeur de la pêche et de l'aquaculture, tout en garantissant que les améliorations économiques vont de pair avec la durabilité environnementale et l'inclusion sociale. Grâce à son avantage comparatif sur le terrain, l'agence FAO nous soutient pour l'amélioration des politiques et les cadres législatifs liés à l'alimentation la, et à l'agriculture, ainsi que pour améliorer la pêche et l'élevage. Je suis heureux d'avoir la FAO comme le partenaire privilégié. J'espère que l'Union européenne et d'autres partenaires de développement continuent à soutenir Sautomé et Principe dans l'accomplissement de notre objectif permanent d'atteindre l'agenda 2030. Notre but est de transformer le pays en une nation émergente axée sur la croissance durable et la création d'emplois parallèlement à la réforme des finances publiques, à la diversification économique et à la modernisation des infrastructures sociales et économiques. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Obrigada, Sr. Presidente, e uh, merci d'avoir souligné la FAO como un partenaire privilégié pour atteindre l'agenda 2030. We looked at wildlife and the sea life. Now, let's move to the land. Land degradation is a massive problem for seeds. Aggravated climate change impacts. The following video is from the Action Against Desertification Program in Fiji. Let's watch the video. Like most rural communities in Fiji, uh, the people of Nassau are highly reliant on uh, natural resources for their food and income generation. But today, uh, you know, more and more land is being cleared for farming. And over time, this has caused a lot of land degradation, which has caused a lot of problems for our communities. So that's why we are here and in villages like this across Fiji. The <laughs> Once the community is aware and motivated, uh, we help them take action. For the next intervention, let us listen to His Excellency Josiah Vorecki Bainimarana, Prime Minister of the Republic of Fiji. As we know, the Prime Minister presided over the 23rd UN Climate Conference, known as the Island COP, and really put seeds at the heart of climate discussion. And from that COP, you have Coronivia Action Agenda, where, which puts agriculture at the center of the climate, uh, the climate agenda. 
Now let's listen to the, to the president of Fiji. Your Excellency, Director General of FAO, Dr. Shu Dongyu, distinguished leaders from African, Caribbean and uh, Pacific small island developing states. Ladies and gentlemen, Bulawinaka, as we say here in Fiji. In our Pacific island nation, the value of agriculture, both to our economy and our society, is immense. The signs are everywhere. Bustling produce markets overflow with fresh produce as our hardworking women and men come out to share their harvest. Colorful fruits and vegetables are sold roadside with vendors happy to serve both a fresh coconut and a smile. Rolling fields, fruit line orchards and backyard gardens line the highways. The Fijian people have long worked the land to feed ourselves, our families and our communities. From subsistence farmers to commercial exporters to a new and growing interest in backyard gardening, farming very much remains a part of Fijian life. And recognizing the potential for growth, our government has been spearheading initiatives that make farming even more attractive, offering seeds and seedlings, materials, guidance, and financial support to those Fijians looking to a future in farming and those seeking the security of subsistence farming to ride out this pandemic. That's because we in Fiji understand agriculture is more than a lifestyle and more than just another industry to fuel our economy. It is a bridge to a healthier, more nutrition secure future for our country and our people. But we also understand that uh, today more than ever, agriculture is under threat both climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic risk putting our vision of a more agrocentric Fiji out of reach. Rising seas, the uh, salinization of soil, erosion and flooding were already rendering once thriving fields untenable. And now, under the pandemic driven duress of closed borders and supply chain disruptions, our agricultural sector is feeling a one-two punch from dual crisis. These are challenges of a scale that no one nation can overcome on its own, let alone the most vulnerable among us. Small island developing states across the globe will need to lean on financial and technical support from partners like the FAO and the EU if we are able to overcome them. So as we respond to a changing climate and rebuild from COVID-19, Let's look to agriculture to be at the heart of our global recovery. Let's lean on nature and the incredible bounty it can provide as we treat it with care. Let us work hand in hand to cultivate healthy soil, healthier people and a healthier planet. And let us plant the seeds of a future that is more sustainable, more ambitious and more aware of agriculture's untapped potential. It starts with each of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Let's work hand in hand. It works with, it starts with each of us. Please join me in thanking all the head of states and governments for joining us in this unique event. Your intervention have conveyed a strong and unified message on the importance of working hand in hand to identify opportunities and priorities for building the resilience of seeds to external shocks and to support the seeds to reduce the vulnerabilities in building back better. I can reaffirm that FAO will continue to support you, particularly in these challenging times of a global pandemic. After this very insightful first part, of our Brussels, Brussels dialogue, let us move on to hear from our partners who will highlight the wide and diversified cooperation FAO has developed with them in supporting small island development states. Let us begin with His Excellency, Justice Niamanga, Chair of the Committee of Ambassadors of the Organization of Africa Caribbean and Pacific States, OACPS. 
We are also very pleased to have with us today, Mrs. Christelle Pratt, Assistant Secretary General of the OACPs for Climate Action and Environment. Let's start with His Excellency, Justice Abuak Nayamanga. You have the floor, Excellency. Thank you very much, Excellencies. Your Excellency Mohamed Fran Ali, President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Your Excellency uh, Wahel Ramkilawan. Pre uh, sorry, Your Excellency uh, Chan Santoki, President of the Republic of Suriname. Your Excellency Tommy Ramengeseu, President of the Republic of Palau. Your Excellency Tulayelapo Maliela Goy, Prime Minister of the Independent State of Samoa. Your Excellency Josiah Vorekwe Bainemarama, Prime Minister of the Republic of Fiji. Your Excellency Georgi Lopeo Bom Jesus, Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of Sao Tome and the Prince. Uh, Your Excellency, Madam Juta Yupilayen, Commissioner of the International Partnership in the European Union. Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Ku Dongju, FAO Director General, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of the OSPS, uh, allow me to thank so much FAO for invitation, and I commend the FAO for organizing this high-level consultative meeting. Excellencies, OSPS is a proud and a long standing partner of FAO. As you all know, 37 out of 79 OSPS member, member states are small islands and the developing states. SEEDS face unique and the persistent development challenges, including their small size, the limited absorptive capacity, high cost of energy, small domestic markets, high levels of unemployment, high transportation cost, unsustainable debt levels, and the vulnerability to the adverse impact of the climate change. These challenges during this unprecedented year are now being further complicated and compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic. Their recovery efforts will eventually need or depends on the ability of the seeds to access financial and other resources to contribute to the building back better in a more sustainable and a resilient manner. North, with understanding, the challenges caused by COVID pandemic is making necessary for the seeds to rethink how to achieve their sustainable development goals through a resiliency lens. We should now end over to travel on a path that ensure our social and economic development on both green and the blue. That is more holistic and that is more inclusive and, in, and innovative. And that take into account the fight against climate change and the protection of the environment as well as striving to achieve the sustainable development goal for 2030. In the OSPS, the Council of Ministers has established a seed forum of ambassadors at the core of the OSPS activities. With our partnership with the European Union, the OSPS has mobilized to support the efforts of its member states to recover from the COVID pandemic. We have mobilized a total of approximately 215 
million euros from the inter-ACP 11th ADF, which was identified for this purpose. In addition, a number of ongoing intra-ACP projects are also taking place in a way of trying to look the better way of dealing with COVID-19 and its consequences. It is my pleasure to note that the SEEDS Forum is working very closely with partners such as EU and FAO to address these challenges that are facing, are facing our, our members. In moving forward, the OSPS with the 79 member states must address the critical issue of finance with one voice, with one strategy, with a compressive manner to ensure that the development partners, donors, and the international finance institutions recognize and acknowledge the vulnerability and the fragility of seeds and eventually develop policies and the tech decisions that will facilitate access to adequate and predictable finance that is needed for development that is sustainable and resilient. The SPS and the EU have recently finalized the negotiations. In fact, we finalized it last week for a new post 2020 partnership agreement, which will be critical to tackling the development challenges of 79 member states while also giving particular attention to seeds and LODCs. We'll have to ensure that the discussions about access to finance continues during the implementation of the new agreement. Before I conclude, Excellencies, I want to assure you that the OSPS stands ready to enhance its work with FAO in order to build genuine and durable partnership in order to support the development objective of SCP seeds and ensure that there is recovery from COVID-19 and the other impacts that are relating to it. So I thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your attention. And I thank you again, FAO, for organizing this important event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. And uh, you highlight the needs for the seeds to rethink how they will achieve the, the sustainable development goals with increased resilience and in a blue and green fashion. But you also highlight the need for adequate and predictable finance to face the vulnerabilities and fragility of seeds. And I think this is very important now that we are going to build back better. And Excellency, your presence gives a strong message on the fruitful collaboration between your organization and FAO. Let me now turn to my colleague, Massimo Torero. Massimo Torero is FAO chief economist. I think he is known by all of you. He has been a very strong voice of FAO and leading FAO's analysis on the impact of COVID-19 on food and agriculture, value chains, food prices, and food security across the globe. Let us first watch a short video showing case some of the foreseen impacts of COVID-19 in small island de development states. Let's watch the video.
this interesting video. Massimo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marilena. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me do a small presentation of what we are observing as the key impacts uh, of, of, of COVID-19 over small islands. Uh, let me uh, start uh, with the context of the presentation. It will compose of an, a context of COVID-19, some impacts and challenges, and some actions and recommendations and what FAO is doing in, in the small islands in this topic. First of all, what we have been observing uh, because of COVID-19 has been a substantial shock. And this shock of both supply and demand had mostly affected uh, small island development states. And, and the reason is because it has affected, of course, as everybody else, the health, but it has also affected the capacity of mobility, which is really important in the small islands because of tourism, which is one of the major sources of revenue, but also because they are food import dependent in most of the cases. And they also depend on remittances, which we are observing today because of the economic crisis they are being reduced substantially as a result of COVID-19. So COVID-19 related impacts in the Pacific Caribbean and African seas have affected remittances, as I mentioned. 47% in remittances in the Pacific has been reduced. It has affected income, less income from loss of employment or less hours work due to COVID-19. Seven out of 10 negatively affected in the Caribbean. Tourism, a major source of revenue for these countries has affected tourism in islands that are dependent on that income, 46% of GDP in Bonatau, travel restrictions, less tourism, jobs and revenues from tourism, 90% drop forecasted for business in the, in, the, in the Cook Islands, for example. Unemployment, hotel closures, and other hospitality closures have caused a spike in unemployment, over 30% in Antigua and Barbuda. Food supply, fragile food supply chains are, are backing due to COVID-19, affecting fisheries, for example, in Mauritius, which is one of the major sources of revenue. GDP has been reduced substantially as a result of all this crisis, for example, declining minus 17% in Barbados. Migration, migration from the urban to rural communities has increased due to a pandemic, the case of Tuvalu and Solomon Islands. So the shocks have been multidimensional and have affected substantially the seeds. But despite that, the seats are still there, still working hard to move forward. COVID-19 is creating an attach, is, is affecting their budgets, uh, is affecting substantially their revenues to pay external debts and preparing for effects of pandemic, not only because of exchange rate evaluations in many cases, but also because of the new ex expenditures they have to do for safety nets. 4% of COVID-19 international funding was given to the seats. 4% of all the funding was given to the seats. Their economies are small and vulnerable to external shocks, and many struggle already in the high debt burdens. So this is exacerbating even more the situation. The economic constraints will lead to a significant increase in poverty and undermine the ability of these economies to withstand natural disasters. Overall, travel and tourism in seats is worth some 30 billion per year. According to NACTA, a decline in tourism receipts by 25% will result in a 7.4 billion or 7.3 fall in GDP. So seats are highly vulnerable to the potential devastating impacts on human health and to the broader and economic effects of virus and containment of policies. And also in a context where they are really affected by climate change too. So what we need to do, as it has mentioned before, is we need to build resilience. And to be able to build resilience, we need to find ways in which these economies can today cope better with the, with the risks they are facing because of COVID-19 but ways in which they can prevent and be prepared for this type of shocks. FAO has developed a COVID-19 response uh, recovery program that has seven priority areas. Global humanitarian response plan, data for decision-making, economic inclusion and social protection to reduce poverty, trade and food systems standards, boosting smallholder resilience for recovery, preventing the next zoonotic pandemic, and food system transformation. In all these areas, together with what we do in hand in hand, as the Director General has mentioned, FAO is trying to help the seats to be able to minimize the consequences of COVID-19, but especially to be able to prepare them for the future and to work with them for the future so that they can build back better, increasing their resilience. Let me give you some examples. 
of actions and recommendations we have been implemented in San Lucia and Barbados, in Grenada, Antigua, Dominica, Barbuda, San Vincent, and the Canaries in the Caribbean. The total amount required is 11.6 million of the activities that we need to work there. In trade and food safety standards, we need to do investments in trade services and logistics for development of the Eastern Caribbean trade corridor. The budget for this is 1.3 million. This is extremely important because seats, especially in the Caribbean, they don't have regional trade. Doing regional trade is extremely difficult. And that's where we need to find ways to, to improve. Interregional trade will be central to be able to move commodities and to be able to increase their capacity and resilience to the recession. We also need to boost the smallholder resilience for recovery. And we have to support for evidence-based value chains development in the CARICOM member countries. And the budget for this is $6 million. And then we need food system transformation, which is investments in water management in the four OECs countries. And the budget is $4.5 million. So this is just an example of the elements we are bringing as part of this. Also in the Pacific, in Fiji, Bunatao, Cook Islands, Solomon Islands, Tuvalu, and Samoa, we are asking for 28.8 .8 million with a gap of 23.7 million. For what? For the humanitarian response, the Pacific humanitarian team aligns with the COVID-19 humanitarian response plan. Data for decision-making, actions will be taken for regional food security and agricultural assessments and evidence-based policy analysis. Boosting the smallholder resilience for recovery, focus on crop, livestock, fisheries, aquaculture, forestry, food processing and storage, emergency preparedness and anticipatory actions. And food systems transformation, where FAO will continue to strengthen rural urban linkages, increase the capacity of urban and peri-urban producers of nutritious and safe food, improve food storage capacities and promote effective procurement. Finally, in Africa, in Comoros, Mauritius, and Seychelles, the request of TCP is over $760,000. In food system transformation in Comoros, the UN Recovery Plan highlights a strong emphasis on the development of agriculture and food systems, two TCPs of $460,000. Trade and food safety standards in Mauritius, integration of COVID-19 aspects in ongoing projects to support the fishery sector has been undertaken, three TCPs at US dollars, $100,000. And boosting smallholder resilience for recovery in Seychelles, support smallholder farmers with agricultural inputs and technical assistance to recover from the shock caused by COVID-19, a total of TCPs of $120,000. Dear colleagues, these effects of COVID-19 on seeds are disproportionate compared to other countries, considering their vulnerability to external shocks pre-pandemic and the declining revenue from lost tourism and other sources such as remittances. Their food supply chains have been disrupted because of delays of transportation and logistics. And this, of course, includes fisheries. FAO has taken quick, quick time, quick action to react with the development of a COVID-19 response and recovery program with seven key priority areas that focus on the most vulnerable in the seats and seats are at the heart of it. With all the above in mind, we must act with urgency to avoid the health crisis turning into a food crisis in the seeds, and especially to build back better, increasing the resilience and the capacity to move forward and to be prepared for something similar to happen in the future. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Massimo, for sharing with us this important presentation and calling us that we need to act together and with urgency to face the vulnerability of the seeds and to support them to face and to build back better. And you refer how the pandemic is threatened the livelihood, food security, nutrition, and climate resilience of small island development states. Now, let me turn to Mrs. Zoritza Urosevic, Director of the Institutional Relation and Partnership Department of the United Nations World Tourism Organization. Um, Madame Zoritza is also like me from Ireland. We are daughter from Ireland. She's from Seychelles. And I know that she has her heart and very strong connection with the seeds. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for having uh, the World Tourism Organization joining this uh, very important discussion. Your Excellencies, Mr. Director General Dong Kyung Dong Yu and colleagues. 
Um, it is beautiful to just uh, continue on what uh, Massimo Terreno was just introducing. Um, it is a great honor for us to be joining us and leaders today to bolster efforts for recovery of seeds. Let me as well share the warmest regards uh, from the UNWTO Secretary General, Mr. Zuro Polovikashvili, on mission in Portugal today, actually following the meeting of the Global Tourism Crisis Recovery Committee. According to our latest uh, World Tourism Barometer, international arrivals fell by 80% in the first eight months of the year, and seeds are showing a decline of 72%. The economic cost of the crisis is eight times the one that of the 2009 global economic financial crisis. It places up to 120 million jobs directly at risk. There is a disproportionate effect on women, young people, rural community, indigenous people, and informal workers who make up 60% of the tourism workforce. So how do we see our sector recovering? According to our panel of experts, a rebound is likely to the third quarter of 21 and the beginning of 22. But we do not see a return to 2019 levels happening before 23. The three main factors standing in the way of recovery are restriction on travel, the slow containment of the virus, and low consumer confidence. Coordination, and I think the event today is really demonstrating that type of coordination that is needed, the coordination at the highest level is vital for addressing all three of these challenges. As I just said, since March this year, UNW2 has united leaders from across the sector. We have spent no effort in supporting countries by providing intelligence, data, uh, guidance, recommendation, technical assistance, recovery packages. Yesterday in Lisbon, our Global Tourism Crisis Committee met for a seventh time. Many of our fellow UN agencies, including WHO and ICAO, were involved, advancing three key immediate priorities. Accelerate the, the lifting of travel restriction and harmonize safety protocols, increase investment in systems and innovation that support safe travel, and sustain and support businesses and jobs in which food security and value chains could be perfectly fitting. If we fail to address these three priority, we will fail to restart tourism and so fail to save millions of livelihoods. We are absolutely conscious of that. Tourism is a key economic pillar of seeds. It accounts for 30% of total exports in the majority of seeds, reaching as much as 80% in some. In 2019, seeds welcomed 44 million of international visitors representing 3% only of the world total of international tourism arrivals. However, international tourist arrivals fell by 72% in seeds since the last eight months, and the road to recovery is said to be long. Seeds have three key characteristics, small size with implication for pressure on resources and limited economic diversity. We have heard it from all the panelists and, uh, and um, uh, excellencies speaking and addressing the audience. Remoteness and isolation leading to challenges for trading. We just he heard it again from the chief economist, but also a unique biodiversity of cultural richness and a maritime environment leading to strong tourism assets, but vulnerability to climate change. The closure of borders has posed the many extra benefits we put on hold, putting biodiversity and cultural heritage in danger. This represents a loss of livelihoods and costs for the blue and the green economy, which is characterized in seeds. For seeds across the Caribbean, Indian and Pacific Oceans, tourism is an essential provider of funding for maritime protected area and conservation efforts. About half of tourists choose coastal destination globally, and therefore marine and coastal tourism provide seeds with more than half of the national income. Ultimately, tourism not only helps to bring in revenue to protected marine area, but it stimulates livelihood grounded in the blue economy. Directly valued at 390 billion globally, it also employs millions of people 80% of them work in SMEs and are dependent on ocean tourism for their livelihoods. I just would like to mention 
Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Amor Motley, who said, the value of the seas, be it for fisheries, extraction of minerals, absorption of carbon, adds materially to the economic base of all, but especially of island states. So a part of having impact, direct impact in the economies of seas, tourism also contributes indirectly through backward and forward linkages of the tourism ecosystem and value chains, or as a source of demand and supply to other sectors, including from transport to agriculture and food. Agriculture, transport, food, and natural resources extraction sector have backward linkages to the tourism industry as they supply the industry's critical inputs. Much of the 60% of estimated food imports in seed can be related to tourism consumption when it occurs. Seeds are facing especially steep contraction economically to due to tourism being a high proportion of the foreign earnings. According to UNDESA, seeds economy could shrink by 4.7% in 2020 as compared to 3% for the world economy. Without strong support, the sudden and expected fall in tourism can devastate economies in seeds. Such major shock translates into a massive loss, jobs, loss of jobs. It also means a sharp decline in foreign exchange and tax revenue, which curbs public spending capacity and the ability to deploy the measures necessary to support livelihood to the crisis. Women are particularly hit, especially with an informal workers. While many seeds have deployed measures to sustain businesses and jobs with the support of international organization, more support is urgent. The external debt of seeds account for 72.4% of GDP on average and foreign reserves are generally low with many seeds possessing only the reserves sufficient for a few months of imports, according to UNCTAD. Seeds face numerous challenges for a significant number. The remoteness affects the ability to be part of the global supply chain, increases import costs, especially for energy, and limits the competitiveness of the sector. According to our research, recovery in global tourism may not start until at least 21, Bold solutions are needed to build back better and maybe reinventing tourism. For some, this means shifting local production towards covering internal needs, which would lessen dependence on imports and increase environmental sustainability. This is the demonstration that FAO has just made in the few initiatives uh, led by the organization uh, with strong partners. Substituting food imports with domestic products or shifting food- May I ask you to try to conclude? I will. Thank you. So we foresee at least five ways that small islands can achieve the security they need. One, by building the capacity of local supply industry and adopting circularity model. Two, supporting financial and technical capacity of SMEs. Three, targeting investment facilitation. Innovation is key. Four, providing support and scaling up digital transformation and advocating for public-private sector collaboration. The current crisis has emphasized the interdependence among countries and the need to step up international coordination, cooperation, and solidarity. People are at the heart of the solutions. Today, all these ingredients are combined and UNWTO is committed to work with FAO and all development partners to build resilient and inclusive economies for seed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Oritza, and thank you for uh, highlighting the linkage between oceans, tourism, livelihoods, uh, the importance of women and how they have been particularly hit by COVID-19 and the need to have the, the interdependency and the, the whole of the international cooperation. Um, I would like to ask our participants to use the chat and the panelists will try as much putting their best to reply to your question in the question and answer box. Now, I'll, I would like to turn to Monsieur Stéphane Bijou. Monsieur Stéphane Bijou it's a, is, is a member of the European Parliament. He's chair of the delegation of the CARI, CARI Forum, EU Parliamentary Committee and member of the delegation to the ACP EU Joint Parliamentary Assembly. Venant de la Réunion and the Partement de la France, Monsieur Bijou, votre perspective sera particulièrement bienvenue dans ce dialogue. Vous avez la parole. 
Merci, merci euh, beaucoup. Excellence, euh, messieurs les présidents, messieurs les premiers ministres, euh, monsieur le directeur général de la FAO, mesdames, messieurs les ambassadeurs, mesdames, messieurs, en vos grades et qualités, d'abord, euh, merci et bravo à la FAO pour euh, ce séminaire. Euh, chacune et chacun, vous avez euh, très bien dit pourquoi et comment le Covid est une épreuve effroyable pour euh, chacun de nous mais il existe une menace planétaire encore plus destructrice, c'est le dérèglement climatique partout dans le monde. Un compte à rebours a commencé et où qu'il soit, eh bien, chacun de nous sera impacté parce que chacun de nous est déjà directement menacé. En fait, le Covid est une première alerte et il a fait la démonstration que sur nos territoires insulaires, nous sommes en première ligne des catastrophes. Le Covid est une grande leçon qui pointe du doigt nos défaillances, mais aussi euh, nos atouts. Je viens d'une petite île française de l'océan Indien. Chez moi, à La Réunion, comme vous, nous sommes en première ligne face à ce monde qui change et qui nous oblige, nous aussi, à changer. Cette crise, elle nous impose l'humilité et en même temps, elle renforce légitimement l'exigence de nos concitoyens pour que les politiques publiques soient plus efficaces. Nous parlons aujourd'hui des petits États insulaires en développement, mais euh, l'impact planétaire du Covid a montré que devant une menace mondiale, il n'y a plus de petits, il n'y a plus de grands. Partout, il y a des humains à sauver et partout, il y a un devoir universel de solidarité. Je suis député européen et face à cette urgence, j'affirme que la responsabilité de l'Union européenne est engagée. L'Europe est le premier bailleur de fonds pour l'aide au développement et l'aide humanitaire au Parlement européen en tant que président de la délégation interparlementaire Cariforum UE avec les institutions européennes et avec tous nos partenaires de la Caraïbe. Je plaide pour dire que l'argent est fondamental, bien évidemment. Il faut maintenir un niveau d'engagement financier important, mais pour sauver des vies, pour lutter contre la pauvreté, pour créer des emplois, pour protéger notre biodiversité et ses ressources. Il faut aussi une coopération sincère, des responsabilités partagées, une confiance solide et surtout un respect mutuel. Je vous remercie. Merci, merci pour partager avec nous euh, vos pensées et de, de nous montrer que les sites sont en première ligne des catastrophes et face à ce monde qui change, il nous oblige, oblige à nous réinventer et que nous avons le devoir universel de solidarité. Et je pense que le rôle des parlementaires est très important dans cette solidarité mondiale. Last but not least, for this partner segment, we have with us today the acting director for Asia, Central Asia, Middle East, Gulf and Pacific, EU Commission Directorate General for International Cooperation and Development, DG DEFCO, Monsieur Jean-Louis Ville. Allow me to underline and thank you for, for your strong and long-standing partnership with FAO. FAO has developed with DEFCO and European Commission a very strong partnership supporting the small island development states. Vous avez la, la parole, Monsieur Le Ville. Monsieur Ville, est-ce que vous nous, nous entendez? Are, are you connected? Sorry, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, there was at the moment, and uh, I couldn't listen up to the end uh, for intro, there was a, a disconnection, so I was lucky enough to be reconnected. So Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, I'm very honored uh, and like to thank you, the Director General, for inviting me to this round table, so to express the EU's interest and partnership with SIDS. The EU is a, is a leading donor and trading partner of the SIDS, but the challenges for SIDS remain huge as we have seen and heard not only due to the challenges linked to the natural disasters, climate change, but also due to the remoteness of the islands, high transport and communication costs, lack of infrastructure, lack of investments, and now on the top of all this, the impact of the COVID. 
On the latter, uh, let me highlight that the EU is contributing to the global recovery through the Team Europe approach, mobilizing around 36 billion to respond to the COVID-19 crisis in partner countries. The EU COVID-19 response to the Pacific amounts 120 million and aims at strengthening the health systems and mitigating the socioeconomic impact. Another important point I would like to uh, uh, convey here is uh, a fact related uh, by other speakers before me uh, regarding the negotiation of the EU, the new ACP EU partnership agreement uh, that we are now about to finalize. Uh, this will provide a solid framework to strengthen our political partnership and expand our cooperation moving beyond development aid to an even more strategic partnership. In line with the Samoa pathway and close cooperation with our partner countries and donors, the EU pays particular attention to address the persistent development challenges of SIDS. For the EU, promoting resilience and supporting implementation of disaster risk management preparedness programs to build resilience is a key priority. But we should also work upstream on resilience, and this approach could entail new systems such as insurance schemes, retrofitting and build back better standards, emergency procurement and financial regulations. Economic and climate vulnerability are other set of key challenges. Therefore, the role of economic and climate vulnerability is now taken into consideration when formulating new budgets for programs. The EU provides a very flexible approach in which we agree on targets for the next five years instead of negotiating actions on a yearly basis. This allows to engage on a constructive policy dialogue. On the challenge uh, for the informal economy, limited use of banks to fund investments, EU supports domestic revenue mobilization and public finance reforms together with improving business climate, for instance, with investment facilities in the Caribbean and the Pacific. The new EU instruments, European Fund for Sustainable Development Plus, as we call it, uh, and the guarantees that it should deploy will allow and should be helpful to attract private investment to the SIDS. The EU pleads for a more structured donor coordination to support SIDS to address their development challenges and already work closely cooperates and cooperates with multinational institutions and multilateral, uh, multilateral development banks, including World Bank, the regional MDBs, the IMF to, co to coordinate COVID-19 recovery efforts. We also need to foster our green transition uh, and work on debt, be, uh, debt relief. We're also strong, strongly engaged on the UN initiative financing for development in the area of COVID-19 and beyond. There, we could share the group recovering better for sustainability to encourage pri private and public investments to meet the SDGs. Given the scale and the complexity uh, of uh, the challenges the SIDS are facing, joint efforts and partnerships between all donors and multilateral partners will be key. The work with the FIO is an excellent example of such close coordination. Together, we have several successful ACP-wide programs running, such as the uh, Fish for ACP, working on sustainable fisheries value chains, or the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program, focusing on wildlife conservation and food security. And most recently, I'd like just to give a last example shortly in Papua New Guinea, where we launched the support to rural entrepreneurship investment and trade in Papua New Guinea, in, in short, straight, aiming to promote sustainable and inclusive economic development and job creation with a focus specifically on women, youth, and climate change. On this, I will now give the floor back to the moderator, uh, thanking you again for listening to me. And this last program will be showcased in the following session. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having me here today. Thank you. And thank you for the overview of the European Commission priorities for the small island development states and the rich overview on the longstanding cooperation between FAO and the EU Commission. Among the projects Mr. Will has mentioned is the support to rural entrepreneurship, investment, and trade in Papua New Guinea, also known by STRAIT. This unique and innovative project 
aims to improve the sustainable and inclusive economic development and job creation, focusing on women, youth, and climate change in Papua New Guinea. The next segment of our, our agenda focus on straight, zooming into its objective in Papua New Guinea. Let's from across the globe and from different time zones, live from Papua New Guinea, we have Pavel Burian. He is the deputy program coordinator of the Strait PNG. He's joined by Mr. James Rice, CEO of Paradise Foods, our partner from the private sector in delivering the activities of the program. Mr. Pavel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And very good afternoon from Papua New Guinea. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. I'm really happy to have today opportunity to introduce you the largest EU funded and FAO led UN joint program in Asia and Pacific. Support to rural entrepreneurship, investment and trade in Papua New Guinea, known as STRAIT. With generous support of the European Union, this program aims to significantly accelerate the economic development of rural areas in PNG, namely provinces Sundown and East Sepik. Targeting quarter million of rural farming households, we use integrated value chain approach to develop strong and resilient sectors of cocoa, vanilla, and fisheries. From smallholder farmers, through small and medium aggregators, up to the exporters and manufacturers, we not only accelerate the economic development, but also improve enabling environment, allowing growth of the rural economy in the country. We connect small to big, and we connect farmers to the markets. And even in this difficult time, program continues to deliver. I would like to illustrate our work on example of cocoa. Let me show you a short video from the field where the cocoa value chain starts. about this partnership and introduce us to Mr. Rice from Par Paradise Food. The floor is back to you. Thank you. Uh, quality production is a foundation of inclusive uh, agriculture development and uh, the same importance as the market connection. That is covered by the straight program as well. FAO recently signed MOU with Paradise Foods Limited, one of the biggest PNG food producers and first national manufacturer of final product, chocolate brand Queen Emma, to significantly increase domestic processing of PNG cocoa and to support its uh, expansion to international markets. Let me introduce to you Mr. James Rice, CEO of Paradise Foods. I'm really happy that James is here today and can present you some insights on the program from the final stages of the value chain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. And I'm really excited to say thank you to you and your program and what you're enabling us to do. Uh, we're the only chocolate producer in Papua New Guinea, and uh, we produce chocolate from bean to bar, and we have aspirations to grow, but we're very small and we can't do it without you. You know, your project enables farmers to learn how to, to grow cocoa beans and to develop an income to bring them an opportunity. And we come behind you with a commitment to buy these cocoa beans from all the farmers that you develop. 
And with that commitment, we're able to grow our business because we have the cocoa beans to do it. So our aspiration is to get 20 times bigger than we are today. And that means that we'll be buying from to 10,000 farmers that you're developing today. Uh, that means income for them. It means foreign currency for our country. It means great chocolate for the world. And uh, all of that, you know, builds up to be really something great because we could say that it's uh, it's family farmed, it's organic, it's fair trade, it's sustainable, and best of all, it's repeatable. It's something that we could do across this country or could be copied in other small island countries. So it's very exciting. I, I got to say, watch us grow. And uh, thank you very much to FAO for your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel, and thank you, Mr. Rice. Thank both of you. We know I know that is very late hour for you. Thank you for being with us. And I believe the program you refer to has a unique and innovative element. We look forward to its progress and, and to see how it can be scaled up to other, other seeds. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before moving to the closing, we are uh, approaching the closing and having the closing remarks by our colleague, Angelica Giacomo Daza, and also enjoy some beautiful Caribbean music. We have some remarks from the Minister of Agriculture of Seychelles, Flavian Joubert. Mr. Joubert, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yes, Minister. Okay. Um, Excellencies, Presidents, Prime Ministers, the Director General of the Food and Agri Agriculture Organization, senior staff of the organization, participants, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I bring greetings and best wishes from the government and the people of the Republic of Seychelles. Today, I am honored and pleased to stand in for the newly elected president of the, of the Seychelles, Honorable Weber Ronkalawan, who regrettably has not been able to, uh, to attend this evening. Even as a sea lot, small island developing state of the Indian Ocean, the Seychelles has not been spared by the scourges of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has afflicted our, our two main industries, that is tourism and industrial tuna fishing. On top of the continuing threat of climate change, these pressing afflictions of the COVID-19 pandemic has increased further the vulnerabilities of our small island states, threatening to deprive our stomachs of the vitalities of life, of our pockets of the essentials of life, and above all, depriving us of the breadth of our existence. Heads of states, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, the Seychelles, the Seychelles people has refused simply to roll over and expire the last breath. Our leaders and the common person have been quite resolute and have come together in these unprecedented times to act in unison and care for and safeguard each other. I salute today the coordinated approach taken to redress the national economy, the role of the National Commissioner of Health and his devoted uh, team who have been relentless in applying the directives of the World Health Organization and to, the, to our people who have understood to change ways and long-standing customs for the preservation of health facilitation of the health facilities to see that the mass transit of foreign seafarers destined for the industrial fishing fleet, which aliments our fish export, which has kept at least one part of our economy moving, albeit at a slower pace. The relentless effort of the tourism marketing and the few embassies overseas to promote the dream now and experience later campaign the daring role of our small national airline to go for tourists in the low risk countries to bring in the much needed foreign exchange, the designation of stay safe hotels and the recently launched online travel advisory, the weekly educational effort of the governor of the Central Bank of Seychelles on national TV to curtail the temptation of being spendthrift. I salute the national government which has sustained to date all those who are without a job through the social benefit program. 
an effort that has continued under the new administration, which took over in November. The subsidies afforded mostly to the national livestock subsector through appropriate levies on imported meats in order to maintain the cost of production and thus keep a steady price to consumers. And also the private sector's continuous engagement with government. I thank the FAO, our organization for the assistance through the much, through the much targeted technical cooperation programs and the many friendly nations for the invaluable assistance to build resilience in the people of Seychelles. After all this, we will have to push for a rebound for small island states. It won't be easy on small island states and they will continue to bleed much needed funds in trying to recuperate after this major disaster. I therefore take this opportunity to call for an open dialogue and also solidarity from all countries, big and small, lenders, international partners, and especially our seeds partners across the globe. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you for uh, calling us on the need of having a coordinated approach and have having open dialogue and more solidarity. I think all the speakers have spoken about the need for more solidarity in this unprecedented moment of uh, COVID-19. Now let's watch a video message from Saboto Cesar, Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries and Rural Transformation of San Vicente and the Grenadines. Mr. Cesar is also currently the chair of CARICOM, Ministers of Agriculture. Let's watch the video. It is time for the world to move towards a program that will be well structured, planned and conceived to ensure that the future of food systems remain secure. Preparedness and response planning are essential to risk management. We are not only facing a pandemic, but we have to continue to grapple with the vagaries of climate change. Resilience is the key to sustainable development. We must also improve our human resource capacity to effectively and efficiently manage multiple hazards. I wish all agricultural sectors globally the very best in our collective efforts to recover and revive our agricultural systems. I thank you very much, and I wish all colleagues the very best for this Christmas season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your video message. I would like to recognize Ambassador Jean-Paul Carteron, Ambassador of Salomon Islands. He was with us, but unfortunately he had to leave. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we reach the end of our very important and fruitful and rich dialogue. And now is my pleasure to turn the floor to our colleague, Angelica Giacomo Daza, as the Director General said, Angelica is the Director of the recently established FAO Office for Seeds and Landlocked Developing Countries for her closing remarks. Angelica, over to you. Thank you, DDG Semedo. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. I would like to thank our distinguished guests and participants for today's successful event. A great number of people connected from around the globe a testament to the interest in addressing challenges faced by small island developing states, including the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. A clear recognition to the need to grant special attention to small island development states. Events like today's high level dialogue are essential in identifying key areas for concrete, innovative and coordinated actions, as well as to reinvigorate partnerships and to mobilize resources to support countries with similar challenges. Our productive discussion has provided a snapshot of challenges faced by small island developing states, while also pinpointing opportunities for collaboration and proposed solutions to build resilience. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, as stated by our Director General, FAO is proud of its genuine, durable, and consolidated partnership with SIDS. 
Consequently, rest assured that FAO will continue to play its part in support of SIDS. It will be the strident advocate, the, His Excellency the President of Guyana referred to in his intervention. From our flagship Hand in Hand initiative to the Global Action Program for Food Security and Nutrition to the establishment of the Office of Small Island Developing States, Least Developed Countries and Landlocked Developing Countries. Small Island Developing States are a priority area for FAO. Also, through our COVID-19 response and recovery program, we aim to assist these countries to build back better. Before closing, allow me to thank again our distinguished guests and participants for the rich and energetic discussion. I would also like to thank the interpreters, audiovisual technicians for ensuring a smooth running of our session. Last but not least, allow me to thank and congratulate the Director General, uh, DTG Semedo, Director de la Puerta, and the entire team from the Liaison Office in Brussels for organizing this fruitful and informative high-level dialogue. I am confident our collective support in favor of, of small island developing states will continue to contribute to better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life for small island developing states where no one is left behind. Thank you again for your participation. I wish you all a good day. Merci à tous. Je vous souhaite une bonne journée. Obrigada a todos. Desejo-lhe um bom dia. Obrigada. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. DG is still with us. I don't know, Director General, if you want to say some final, final words to, <laughs> to okay. the participants. Yeah, I, I, I listen. I, I, I didn't show up, but I followed the engaged. First of all, I thank you so many leaders and, uh, and uh, to really, you know, if you, I said the four function, policy consultation and the platform for vulnerables to show to visibility. If you are, I said, isolated island should become the hub yeah, of the uh, 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 central point for the future, because it it's looks the uh, public goods for the environment, for biodiversity. Small island is not a small. It should be big agenda for UN and for FAO, of course. And also I appreciate the uh, uh, Rodrigo and the Brussels uh, office to make it hard to, together with Angelic and the office for Small Island. We said also, uh, we have to put the uh, uh, division organization more function, fit to the purpose. That's why I, I, I established that the Small Island the office, landlocked office. Because only one UN professional organization has this specific. So that's why I also encourage Semedo several times. You are daughter of the small island. Yeah. So you should, be, uh, not only it's your responsibility, it's your passion. You have to have the, those small island states, the landlock, the to have uh, some uh, project collectively. Yeah? Not one small island is small, but the 10 small islands are not small anymore. Yeah. That's a collective, a comprehensive power, yeah? So I, I encourage you, I will always be with you, for sure. Because I, I think uh, uh, many years ago, first time I, I, I traveled to this small island in South Pacific, I looked at the map and people always think from the continent, not from the island. That was uh, 20, two years ago. So I started, I said, we should change the way I look at the small island. If we stand the small island and look at the continent, a small island is a central point of the world. So let's do it step by step and we will change it and offer the tangible results, which so many years ignore it in FAO. Uh, even you are daughter of the small island. But you need the support from DG, I know for sure. It's not the, your force. It's our force who uh, not care enough. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you, DG. Let's do it. Let's do it together. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the series of FAO Brussels Dialogue will continue next year. Let's join our voices to congratulate our colleagues from the Br Brussels office for organizing this very fruitful dialogue. 
Let's thank our interpreters and all behind the scenes who contributed to the organization of this successful event. Thank you all for being with us today. Have a restful evening. Merry Christmas, a happy new year. Stay safe and now, now let's enjoy some Caribbean music. Stay with us, thank you. distant lands our forefathers came some seeking adventure some bound in change through battles waged and fought through victory and pain by test of their courage our freedom was gained In homage to those gone before us, us The heroes of lands in the sun We vow to join hands and to focus On building one Caribbean Raise your voices high Sing of your courage 